Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to Baroness Stroud and to uh, Jordan Peterson for organizing this uh, marvelous conference. I, I arrived late last night from Rome, where I just spent the last month at this uh, synod. So just got here this morning, and I've been uh, taking in with great joy this, uh, this gathering. I felt right at home when I came in. There's Martin Luther King back there, one of my great heroes. But then someone pointed out to me another great hero of mine over here, Bob Dylan. Anyone that's followed my work knows that I've been relying on him for a long time. And that's a marvelous quote, and it's reminiscent of one of his songs where he says, Freedom just around the corner from you, but with truth so far off, what good would it do? That sums up my talk on freedom and responsibility. Uh, I think, too, of another Bob Dylan line, um, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Uh, there's a lot of bad winds blowing around in our culture, and we shouldn't be listening to the strange weathermen who are trying to <laughs> interpret them for us. We know what some of these winds are doing, and we just heard it beautifully presented to our kids, what's happening to our culture. And a lot of it does indeed hinge upon the resolution of this problem of freedom, which is so important to us in the West. I know, it's the supreme value in many ways. But freedom has to be joined to truth, to responsibility. Now, I've been a, a teacher of theology for a long time, so I'm very sensitive to how a lot of the questions we engage today culturally are descended from very old theological arguments and debates. And this is a very good example of it, freedom and responsibility. Can I take you to an obscure question buried within the Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas Aquinas, along with Bob Dylan, a hero of mine? Aquinas had just determined that God is free. And then he asked this peculiar question. Whether God can sin, interesting question, isn't it? Like, can God sin? And you say, well, yeah, heck, God is free and he's God. He can do whatever he wants. And I'm a little puny creature and I can sin. How much more God can sin, right? And Aquinas' famous answer is, no, God cannot sin. Now, how come? Because in God, his will, his freedom, is so ordered to his own goodness that it would never deviate from it. Just as God's mind is always ordered to the truth of his own being, God is consistent with himself. And here's the trick. Precisely because he can't sin, he is truly free. Okay, that's Thomas Aquinas. Now, just go a couple of generations later, another strain of theology emerges that puts a great stress on God's power. Indeed, his potentia absoluta, his absolute power. God's will is so powerful that it determines reality. Now, here I'm thinking of, now we're in the British Isles, uh, William of Ockham is one of the medieval uh, theologians responsible for that view. In his absolute power, God decides that two plus two equals four. Suppose God decided it was equal to five. Well, so it would be. In his supreme power, God determines that adultery is a sin. Could he say adultery is a virtue? Yeah, yeah because his power is that absolute. Notice in Aquinas, God's freedom and his goodness coincide. On the second reading, freedom and goodness have become divorced. Now you say, okay, that's an interesting abstract little tour of theological history. No, no, but those two views, everybody, have been transposed into an anthropological key. They have a lot to do with how we understand freedom, this supreme value in our culture. And I think getting it right will make an enormous difference in how we educate our kids and how we heal our culture. I'm gonna be up front, it's the Aquinas solution that's the right one. The Occamist is the problematic one. Thomists are behind me on this one. Well, let me explain to you why. Transpose these two theological positions now into anthropology. 
What's freedom? Well, one view I would say very popular in the West and especially popular in our culture today is what I would call a freedom of indifference. That means that the free will hovers above the yes and the no, option A, option B, and on the basis of no constraints, internal or external, makes a choice. I decide. I decide in a sovereign freedom that I will do this or that, that I will be this or that, that this or that is true. And only when I come to that point am I truly free. The freedom of indifference. Notice here the stress is on self-creation. It's freedom from external constraint so as to find freedom for self-expression. Now, does that sound familiar? I mean, it should. It's, it's just in the air we breathe in our culture. It's the anthropological version of William of Ockham's view of God's freedom, right? Sheer sovereignty that creates reality. Notice on that reading too, the law is a kind of enemy of freedom. It's at best accepted as a necessary evil, like, you know, traffic laws. Because, you know, look, I'd love it if there were no traffic lights and all that, but I know to, you know, solve traffic problems, we need these laws but I kind of prefer if we didn't have them. Law is at best a necessary evil. All right, contrast that freedom of indifference to what I'll call freedom for excellence. Now what's that? I'll define it this way. It's not self-determination, not free choice so much. It's the disciplining of desire so as to make the achievement of the good first possible and then effortless. Let me just say that again, then I'll give you examples. On this reading, freedom is the disciplining of desire so as to make the achievement of the good first possible and then effortless. Now, example. So I stand before you as at least a relatively free speaker of English. I can say pretty much anything I want to say in English. I can express a whole range of emotions, ideas, feelings, experiences. And anyone in this room that's gone through the experience of learning a foreign language knows what I'm talking about. What you feel when you're struggling with a new language, at least I did, is unfree. I remember when I was a, I was a doctoral student years ago in Paris, and I'd be around these you know, seminar tables with really smart francophones from all over the world. And, and I was there too, I thought, well, I, I'm <laughs> smart enough, but, but I, was, I, I was unfree, I, I couldn't express what I wanted to say. Now, how did I get free to speak English? By doing whatever I want, <laughs> by, by choosing to speak any old way I want to. Well, of course not. I became free by internalizing the laws and syntax and grammar and vocabulary of English. And I, I listened to great masters like Martin Luther King and yes, like, like Bob Dylan and, and internalized the rhythms and the, and, the, and the content and the beauty of the English language. And in the measure that that objective good became coherent with my will, I became free to speak English. Another dumb example, I'm sure there must be a lot of golfers here, right? We're near the home of golf anyway. Um, we golfers, you know, 99% of us are horrible, right? We amateur golfers. Uh, but we love reading um, Golf Digest and the golf magazines that, that go through the, the laws of golf, right? The, the laws that govern the golf swing, why? Because we know the more we internalize those laws, the freer we get. The, the, the problem with us bad golfers is we're out on the golf course, we know exactly what we want to do, we know exactly the kind of shot we want to hit, but we're not free. Because we, we've not internalized the rhythms and the discipline of the swing. Think now of the Bible. 
Lord, how I love your law. How I meditate upon it day and night. Think of David dancing before the law as, it's, as the Ark of the Covenant is brought into Jerusalem. Can you imagine someone dancing in front of the tax, tax laws of this country? <laughs> but see, as a golfer, I totally get it. I get my golf digest and I read it with rapt attention. Please tell me more of the laws of golf. Because they're making me free. All right, let's just take a last step. So we've gone from the theological, these different ideas of God's freedom, and then to anthropology, to the way we understand human freedom. And now look at our culture today. And this has changed in the course of my lifetime. I think the default position of most young people in the West today is that I'm the sovereign source of value. I'm the sovereign decider of meaning. On the basis of no compulsion, interior or exterior, I will decide who I am, what gender I am, how I should live. Don't lay your value trips on me, I decide. You see how it's the Occamist view of God now become the default position of every teenager in the West. Do you want to know now, in a deep philosophical and theological sense, why so many young people are so lost and unhappy? That's it, it seems to me. It's a freedom divorced from responsibility, freedom divorced from truth, freedom just around the corner from you, but with truth so far off, what good would it do? It's like handing a kid a golf club and saying, just swing any old way you feel like it. Well, of course, he'll be a miserable, unhappy golfer. But place those laws and values of golf within him. He'll become a free and joyful golfer. The Catholic philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand, one of my favorites, he talked about the intuition of value. Value, value. What's that? It's something that's objective. It's outside of the little boring, well-lighted space of my own subjectivity. It's when you, you hear, you know, Beethoven's Seventh Symphony for the first time and you're lifted up out of yourself. It's when you hear about the moral heroism of uh, Maximilian Kolbe and, and you're challenged to the root of your being. It's, it's the beautiful that arrests you you know, aesthetic arrest, it stops you in your tracks. It elects you and then it sends you on mission. It's, it's James Joyce, you know, in the portrait of the artist when he sees the young girl out on the, the strand and his whole life is transfigured and he's found his vocation. That's what happens when objective value breaks into your life. And von Hildebrand talks about value response. And he has beautiful analysis of how this happens intellectually when you know the truth of something, the form of it. It happens at the level of the will when you say, I, I want that, I want to be part of that. It happens at the level of the aesthetic perception when you say, that's splendid. And your body's involved in it. And we all know that. When, when you're in the presence of a great value, it affects you in your, in your bones and in your blood, right? Teaching value response, he thought, was the most important thing we can do in education. Not teaching kids, do whatever you want, become, you know, become the inventor of value. No, no, no. What a, what a tiresome, boring uh, uh, orientation that would be. Rather, as Aristotle said long ago, the point of education is teaching children what they should want. <laughs> that there be mentors and masters who say, these are the values that you should incorporate. And see, when you do that, people become responsible, able to respond, capable of responding to objective value. See, I think everybody, that's the fundamental problem. 
If we're the inventors of value, we're going to live increasingly in a dull and dangerous world. But if we can teach at all levels, our young people especially, to appreciate objective value and align their wills to it. Can I close with a biblical uh, citation? St. Paul quite rightly is seen as the, the father in many ways of the Western preoccupation with freedom. Paul's a great disciple of freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Quite right. But, but that same St. Paul, introducing himself to the Romans, said, I am the slave of Christ Jesus. Now, can I submit to you, that makes zero sense on a freedom of indifference view. You know, if I, I just hover above the yes and the no. No, no, if I'm anybody's slave, I'm not free. But on the freedom for excellence, it makes perfect sense. In the measure that Paul had internalized Christ, it's no longer I who live. That's the old self, this boring, you know, tiresome old self. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. That's when Paul became free. And I think that's the coming together of freedom and responsibility we ought to be teaching our kids. God bless you all. Thanks.